Kanyasani, thank you so much, bro, for taking the time to chat to me today. Um, I've been really looking forward to this interview, and I think, you know, having looked at your career journey thus far, there's a lot that we can learn from, from you. I mean, you started in, in engineering, geology, mining, chemistry. You're now an investment banker. Uh, a lot has happened between those two points, which I think yeah, is, is, is fitting for us to explore and pick up a lot of learning points. But before we get there, maybe just give us a sense of who is Kanyisani. Um, Kanyisani, of course, is a, a young man from the east of Johannesburg, uh, from a small town called Boxburg. Uh, born and raised um, Orthodox Roman Catholic, I think was my starting point. Um, went to a school called Christian Brothers College. Um, I think then went to university here in Johannesburg. Yeah. So I think the city of gold has really uh, been home for me. I, I, I don't think, it, you know, I was born here, I was raised here. I still live here. Um, went to the University of Johannesburg and as you mentioned, studied geology, chemistry, um, along the way got a taste for commerce and, and somehow left the mining space and really landed in uh, the financial services space. Um, and now I look back, uh, I've been involved in um, the financial services space, mainly uh, investment banking for close on 11 years now. So I've um, been here for a while, but it's been, it's been a roller coaster of a ride, lots of learnings. Uh, yeah. Lots of adventures, lots of deals. Um, yeah, and I think that pretty much describes who I am. I'm a family man, so um, recently got married. Uh, I enjoy sports, so like home on a weekend is really lots of sports in the background or, you know, playing around a golf with some friends. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what I do. I've recently taken up some target shooting as well, which is new. It's exciting. So, yeah, hopefully you know, can, can get better and better at that. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I have to ask, you say you grew up in the East Rand. I, I thought maybe you may have spent some time in the British land, you know, uh -huh. given your accent. Where does that come from? Um, sure. Maybe I, I remember one of, my, one, of, one of the first things that uh, I learned when I started school. Um, I was very, very shy. And my mom at that point had said, you know, we're taking you to this Model C private school. Um, but whenever I'd go home, I'd never speak English. Um, and yeah. then my mom reported me to my, my first grade teacher and, you know, saying, you know, he never speaks English. And, and I think from that point onwards, my teacher insisted on it. And, and also I'm a very avid reader. So again, it's just, you know, you practice all of these things and, 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 and sort of learning to enunciate. So uh, I've been very fortunate that, um, you know, academia has always been big in my family. So yeah. reading, speaking, um, a lot of people in my family, so my cousins, you know, were, were avid debaters growing up. So you learn from them and you, you pick up these things from them as well. Fantastic. Uh, you're speaking about, uh, you know, being an avid reader and your family as well. Um, would you say they played a key role in you choosing the degree that you studied, um, how did you come to choose studying geology and chemistry? It's a strange one. Um, so Boxburg is an old mining town. So probably it, it lended itself to growing up around mine shafts and all of those things. But at the same time, a lot of my friends were probably guys who said, look, we're going the BCom route, Axi route. So really commerce inclined. And so a lot of the times I would be the the strange one and, and the, the, the conversations would be around financial terms, financial terminology, that played one part in it. So my interest came from there. And then I think it was just a curiosity. Um, I, I did some VAC work for a mining consultancy and really started to look at the, at the time, the value chain, which was in mining and, 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 and saying, okay, well, I see the role that I'm currently going to fill yeah. um, once I'm qualified. But what are the different pieces and where does the money come from to do all of these things? And, and I guess I was very fortunate that also I'm, I'm not one to be afraid to cold call um, and, and picked up the phone, um, called up one of the mining. Um, Nedbank at the time uh, was uh, a leading project finance mining house. Um, so reached out to one of the guys there. Um, he indulged me and, and, and sort of arranged 
for somebody to meet up with me. And, and, and strangely enough, or, or fortuitously, um, he happened to be somebody who studied geology and was now in, in investment banking. So we had a long conversation and, and, um, and subsequently that guy became a bit of a mentor to me uh, in terms of giving me the right level of advice to say, hey, look, it's all good and well, you can go to the mines, um, spend a few years there, all of these things, but eventually you're gonna wanna get into banking. You probably have an opportunity now, or if I was in your shoes, I would probably do it, you know, straight off the bat, mm -hmm. um, rather than trying to come back into, the, into, into banking at a much later stage, because why? You can build um, the experience, and actually that can open up a, a lot of other opportunities for you. Yeah. So that really was how I got into it. And then um, I applied for the NetBank grad program, and, and I'm always a firm believer of, uh, you know, when you're very intentional about something, I think the universe conspires because you know, I applied for this grad program and got accepted. And, and you know, I remember telling some of my, my honors year um, colleagues to say, no, I'm no longer going to the mines. I'm actually going into banking. I, I mean, they found it so strange. Like, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, geologists don't go into banking. Uh, everybody was headed to the mines or consulting or whatever. Um, and, and, and again, you know, all these things just started to happen. And um, made more friends from, from the grad program uh, in the interview process. So again, you know, destiny kind of worked in terms of pushing me in that direction. And, and who am I to, to work against it, right? So uh, I then started off in the NetBank grad program. Um, wasn't put into project finance, but rather was put into corporate finance mining advisory. Um, I think NetBank uh, had a growing practice where we advised a lot of... Um, the sort of upcoming uh, BE type mining houses, yeah. plus some of the smaller sort of mid cap um, mining houses of South Africa as well. So it was a great space to be in. And I, I certainly believe that corporate finance is great because, you know, you, you learn, you know, you learn about project finance, you learn about advising clients. Um, it, it, it gives you, for me, a much broader skill set when it comes to being involved in banking. Yeah. Because from there, there's pretty much no place you can't move within the bank and really kind of quickly adapt. Yeah. I'll, I'll come back to the investment banking journey, but I'm curious to know, did you actually work in the geology field after you qualified? Um, so I worked for a small period of time within the mining sector. Okay. Um, I, again, the same place where I learned about investment banking, um, the mining consultancy, was where I started off sort of, um, what I did was, I, I did my undergrad and then I took a year off just to learn what I was gonna do because I think at the time there was a, a general uncertainty to say, well, what happens after this? So yeah. took a year, um, worked within the consulting space. So again, it was great because you could touch on so many different facets of, of mining, mining services, um, so I got a chance to be a resource geologist, so learning how to model um, different types of uh, ore bodies, whether it be coal, gold, um, copper, etc. Mm -hmm. um, got involved in geotechnics, uh, really, which looks at um, pit design and mine design uh, and stabilities. Um, and then I also then got some exposure as ex an exploration geologist. So during that time, I think... Uh, for the first time in my life, I spent about close on three months um, out in near Mustina. Okay. So really a beautiful part of the country, extremely hot, but, you know, uh, gave me a real taste for being away from home for yeah. extended periods of time. Um, but also just really what an exploration rig and running an exploration rig um, requires. So really that for me gave me all, a, a lot of the, the dimensions of what being in mining is all about, yeah. excluding the, the money part, right? Yeah. And, and that was the, the, the part of the whole value chain, which I then was like, okay, well, I want to understand that, right? Mm -hmm. All these things that we're doing, we're drilling for core, we've got, got all of these um, you know, guys uh, that are working and drilling, 
we've got budgets for machinery, mm -hmm. etc. But how does all of that come into play? Mm -hmm. um, and and so really that therein started my real curiosity of, you know, what how do how do mining projects get get funded? Yeah. Um, you know, from companies, from banks. And, and, and obviously banks' names came up, right? So kind of said, okay, well, you, you gotta, maybe we've got to double click into this thing and, and really look to understand it um, a little bit more. And I think that therein sort of my curiosity plus, you know, the curiosity having hung around friends who are commerce inclined plus all of this geology stuff then kind yeah. of said, well, actually this mining project finance or, or, or getting into banking, looking at mining thing sounds interesting. And and, and, and really my curiosity um, evolved from there. Um, I, I've always been a curious person, so uh, it, it, it helps because then, you know, you can pick up books and you can kind of get lost in them trying to learn these things. But also, like I said earlier, um, the ability to just cold call yeah. uh, and, and reach out to people because yeah. you're curious. And I think when you're a student, people tend to indulge you a little bit more, yeah. um, you know, uh, and, and give you the time of day because you know, you're wanting to know a little bit more. You're coming from a place of, I find what you're doing quite interesting. Can you tell me more? Um, and people, I think, or maybe I was fortunate that I, I encountered people who were very open about teaching and, and giving advice to, to this bright-eyed student um, trying to know more about uh, the industry. Yeah, yeah. You're speaking about cold calling, and I think it takes a lot of courage for someone to do that. Uh, is that something that is, you know, a natural gift for you or did you have to develop that skill? Uh, desperation, right? Um, I think my nature is actually to be quite shy and reserved. Um, but I think at the time, I remember at Varsity, I was a self-funded guy at uni, so I didn't have the luxury of prearranged vacation work. So you quickly have to learn that, okay, well, now you've got to put in some calls to mining houses, mining consultancies to see whether they're open to the idea of somebody spending a little bit of time there um, learning what they do and, and probably becoming part of their, their talent pipeline, um, although unexpectedly so. So you, you learn to cold call a lot of people. You learn, you know, uh, that, uh, that, 30 second elevator pitch very, very quickly because you need to quickly um, articulate to somebody who you are, what do you want, um, and really try and get them interested in saying to you, send me your resume, let me have a look, and I'll come back to you. And, 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 and learning to also just pursue that, right? It's one thing to just send a, send a, a resume, but it's another thing to obviously gently nudge and, and people get very busy. Um, in, 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 in the work environment. So, you know, you are so low down the pecking order of things that you want to try and push yourself up uh, a little bit more so that somebody at least gives your CV a look mm -hmm. and then says either yes or no. Yeah. Um, the quicker they say that, the quicker you then kind of move on to other things, etc. cetera. And, and I guess that's where a lot of the cold calling uh, in me kind of helped. Um, I think also the other piece of it during university, I, I used to do a lot of uh, work in trade shows. Um, so I worked at Randy's to show um, as a salesman um, selling the, the weirdest kind of paving um, mold ever. And, uh, you know, you learn to, to find the magic, right, in something as, as boring as a, a paving mold but learning to pull people in and learning to speak to crowds and not be intimidated, right, by, yeah. by large crowds or saying to people, come and have a look and really kind of laying out what, what you're selling. So I think life has kind of put me in situations where uh, the shy side of me had to, had to be overcome by a courage um, to really do things and not be shy to, to stand in front of people, to yeah. pick up the phone. Um, in order to lay out what, what yeah. I'm trying to do. I think that's really powerful because, as you say, for someone who thinks they are naturally shy, which you don't appear to be, um, and to take those courageous steps to reach out to strangers, 
Um, you know, it, it takes a lot. Um, and I would imagine you probably also got rejected along the way. Yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, it felt as bad as uh, when, 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 when a girl rejects you, right? You just like, <laughs> you get so, so disheartened. But, but I think I, I also, again, always link a lot of things back to home. Uh, I come from a place where, you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. You know, don't let one closed door stop you. Um, you know, you keep you keep knocking. You move on to the next door, um, and 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 look, you you smarten up along the way, right? In terms of your approach, you get better at things. And and I think in the beginning, yes, when I when you knock on doors, you know, your approach might not work. But you go home, you know, when you're feeling disheartened, and you kind of correct yourself, and you and you find better ways of doing things. You talk to people who have succeeded in um getting the door open to them and see what skills do they have mm. um i think for me my personality is really very much like a like a sponge i i i learn from people you know i i always say to my wife i don't think that i'm the smartest guy ever but you know leave me around very intelligent people long enough and and i certainly believe that um i can learn so much more such that um, you know, you might think that, wow, you know, this person actually is one of the smartest people in the room. So, so for me, I, I love to absorb knowledge. I love to absorb just insights from people. So um, that for me has been a, a huge asset along the way in, in, in a lot of the things that I do. Fantastic. Uh, going back to your, you know, your studies in varsity, um, when you chose to, you know, uh, take on geology, um, some people may not be aware as to what geology entails. Are you able to break it down for us in a simple manner? If someone is a qualified geologist, what, what do they actually do? Um, sure. To go back to one of my professors, I think it's a, it's a study of the earth sciences, really. To, uh, that's, that's its original definition, right? Understanding the genesis of the earth, you know, how old the earth is, how, um, very, how the earth was formed, um, and really then it builds on that. So understanding um, how diamonds are formed in the Earth's crust, how um, various minerals came to being, um, the different environments that the world that we see now isn't the world that it was, say, a million years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and really, it's the study of that and understanding what that is all about. Um, to be honest with you, it never, it never started off with me wanting to study geology. I enjoyed chemistry. Um, mm -hmm coming out of high school. Uh, so it became one of those, what do I pair up my chemistry with and what is it best complemented with? And geology has a high degree of chemistry linked to it. Okay. So it made good sense, but I still coupled it with, uh, with other courses as well. So I did maths, I did physics, um, I did applied maths as well. So various other pieces um, added to that. But in the end, the two that worked hand in hand were the geology and the chemistry. Um, and I thought, if I continue down this path, you know, at the time, not even uh, the idea of banking having not been born yet, um, it felt like this is where I want to continue. Even if I had to go the, the lab route or if I wanted to go work for a company like Sasol, the chemistry plays a part. Yeah, yeah. If I want to go into mining, the geology plays a part. So again, it gave me a, a good balance of what I thought is a good foundation for, um, you know, future career endeavors. Yeah, I have to ask: Did uh, remuneration take any have any uh, driver in what course of study you pursued? <laughs> um, no, not not really. You know, I know a lot of a lot of my friends who followed the CA background. Obviously, were like chartered accountants, this and 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 the other. But for me, again, I go back to it when I was. Studying the geology and the chemistry, it was, it was the passion for the subject matter and not really looking. At, it kind of felt like if I, if I find myself in the right institution, uh, I'll be able to provide for myself. Yeah. Um, the banking side of things kind of came about and, and, sh and I think it, it quickly became apparent that actually this could be a very attractive career path to, to pursue. But... I've never been driven by, by money. I think for me, 
money is important, yes. I'm not going to shy away from that. But also, I, I, it's, it's also about honing a craft, doing what you enjoy. Yeah. Um, none of the things that I've mentioned, banking is a, is a hard career. Um, I, think, I think ask anybody that's been in it. They'll tell you, you know, they're, they're good days, they're bad days, they're all night days. And so for me, the money comes almost at the back of that. You have yeah. to do the work. Yeah. Um, you have to, there's, there's a certain grit that you have to have for banking. Um, and so money for me is, is it's there. And yes, it, it is a nice incentive, mm. but also honing a skill, honing a craft, um, learning that probably for me is is the the tip of the spear when yeah. it comes to these things and and sort of the, the the economics come after all of that yeah because also by the way um if you're not good at what you do mm -hmm. then the money quickly <laughs> doesn't show itself yeah and you get frustrated as well and all of those things yeah fantastic fantastic um you know as far as studies are concerned you're a smart guy and you could have chosen to go study anywhere um what was so attractive about university of johannesburg that made you decide to go there um i think firstly i think um the university of johannesburg had had a very good accounting program so again that probably for me said well there must be other pockets or uh, of excellence within the university. Yeah. Um, the School of Geology was was pretty good. Um, you know, I, you, you look at some of the lecturers, you see some of the papers that they've published, yeah. um, some of the institutions where they've they've traveled to and lectured in, and, mm. and really it felt this is a good place to be, um, a good place to learn. And this was on both sides, even on the chemistry side as well. Um, you had a lot of strong chemistry lecturers and professors mm. um, coming out of there. So it just made, for me, made it a very easy choice. I mean, look, uh, being born in Johannesburg, living in Johannesburg, Wits is always a, a natural default. But also, sometimes, I think it was the idea that I also want to chart a different path. A lot of my friends were going to Wits, and I said, well, maybe try something new because this is going to be, you know, uh, like high school, right? Like, like us hanging in the neighborhood. It's great, but, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't stretch you in any way. Um, you need to be able to go and learn new things, meet new people. Um, and I'm certainly going to a slightly different institution yeah. um, can be helpful for that. Fantastic, fantastic. Let's come back to your investment banking career, um, where I think there's a lot of stuff for us to unpack there. Uh, you've mentioned banking is a very hard career. Can you take us back to those early days at NetBank when you just started uh, in investment banking? What was it like? It was hard. Uh, I mean, I think, uh, firstly, coming from my own background uh, and less so a commerce background, it's a very steep learning curve, right? Uh, you quickly need to understand. I done, fortunately enough, I had high school uh, accounting uh, behind me, which made certain terms not too unfamiliar. Yeah. But obviously, um, everything else is an addition, right? But thankfully enough, you know, it's not just accounting alone. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many other facets. So, you know, I think where I was fortunate that within the bank, I focused quite a bit on mining. So it, it, it also showed other areas where I was very strong. Mm. So understanding mining terminology and, and how things come together from a mining perspective, and then sort of um, uh, adding that on, you know, to adding accounting and various financial um, terminology to all of that, yeah. then was, was super helpful. But I think it was hard, but I think at the time, we all um, maybe are surrounded by a lot of people who, who understood you know, what, what it takes. Yeah. Um, the hours were long, you know, it was strange because, you know, having to explain firstly to my mom, what is corporate finance? Um, secondly, explaining to her, why am I coming home late at night? I think at the time I was still staying at home. So, and it was worse because I lived all the way out in Boxburg. So it was early mornings and late nights, right? And, and my mom just couldn't understand in her mind, you know, a job is a nine to five, right? <laughs> you come home, 
you know, you have dinner with your family, you go to bed. Now I was coming home, I was, you know, have food prepared. Sometimes I eat, sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. But it was the sacrifices that we made. I mean, I remember um, a couple of friends who also came in from other directions and we'd all be in the parking lot at Nedbank at like 6.30 in the morning because we came from so far that if we'd left late, we'd be caught in traffic. And if we left work too early, we'd be caught in the traffic heading back home. So what choice do you have? You stay in the office, you, you do the work. Yeah. Um, but also the more time you put in, the, 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 the more efficient you become at mm. things. Mm. Um, that's what I've learned with, with banking. You understand things, you can decode things a lot better. So the steep learning curve is great because, you know, you, you, you then quickly see where your shortcomings are, what you need to work on, um, and, and you bolster all of those things. But also um, working with people, you know, that was what I enjoyed as well, is, is you could learn from different types of people. Um, and, and it's only in the trenches, only during the hard times that, you, that the real learning comes. When things are nice and casual, yes, there's, there's learning that comes there, but it's when it's late nights, uh, all-nighters, you know, um, sort of um, short fuse uh, requests from clients uh, and you have to do things in a, you know, like somebody says, I need this later today and you're, you're cruising through everything, um, but you still have to be, the quality of the work yeah. cannot ever be compromised. So you learn a lot of things um, and, and that for me was, was the great part uh, during my time at Nedbank and and all the other institutions um, I've worked for thereafter. Um, I think what Nedbank taught me, or maybe I, I already inherently had it in me, was not to be afraid to roll up your sleeves, right? Um, as you progress, obviously, some things, you know, you don't do, but other things you, you take on and you say, well, I'm happy to do this thing. I think what, what, what investment banking has taught me is um, collaboration is, is key. So no man is an island. Um, I think collegiate um, teams are the teams that I've seen really do well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, the teams that get along, the teams that have been together for a, a certain period of time. I think this, when you have that stability, it for me creates the groundwork for for really doing well in the market. And you then couple it with, with things like a, a great franchise, um, you know, strong leadership. Um, and that really then, you know, you, you're now building a Rolls Royce um, when it comes to investment banking teams uh, and teams that, that can really perform at a high level. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks for, for sharing those insights. I think you've shared uh, quite a mouthful there. I wanna go back to you know, you talk about being in the trenches. It's a hard graft, early mornings, late nights, weekend work. I mean, I know corporate finance is a, it's a unique uh, career uh, and not many people can stomach that. When you were going through those times, what kept you going? Because it's, it's not normal to be waking late. Uh, you know, you're getting a lot of negative feedback sometimes and you still have to keep pushing. What was the driver behind your persistence? Sure, um, good question. I think part of it was just achievement, uh, wanting to deliver a really good product. I, I, I enjoy good feedback uh, that you know, you've really kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of the solution that you provide to clients. Yeah. I, I like the idea that you know, um, we've worked together as a team and we've delivered this thing um, and really the quality of the analysis, um, the insights is, is top class. So mm -hmm. for me, those were the drives, right? Mm -hmm. Those were the drives to deliver. But also I think sometimes you just, you just didn't have a choice, right? Yeah. Um, because part of our businesses are client focused businesses, mm -hmm. you know? So you want to be at the cutting edge. I think what I've learned over the years is that, you know, the ability to deliver work quickly, succinctly, but having applied a lot of deep insights mm. is great because clients sometimes have, you know, real time problems. Yeah. And you need to sometimes try and give them real time solutions. That's powerful. So that was probably one of the things is to say the ability for us to deliver 
high quality work very, very quickly. And yes, it's going to put us under a, lot, a bit of a strain, but that really elevates you uh, in terms of how you're perceived by your clients um, and the sort of advice that you give. I think always working towards being the preferred advisor by any means necessary, right? Making sure that, you know, you know a client has a list of advisors, but you want to be at least, you know, the top three, if not the top advisor, that when they have a problem, they pick up the phone, they call you first, you know, before they go to anybody else. And, and that's great because then it helps you anchor any ideas right up front um, so that whatever, whoever else they speak to, they'll always be coming from a position that, you know, they've already been told one thing which may be leading to the solution that they need and they're just testing it out now. And somebody else might obviously come with a different, with a different angle. Yeah. I would rather be the one that crystallizes the idea rather than the one that's trying to shape the idea now that it's, uh, it's you know, taken root or, or whatever. And I think the, the long hours, the, 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 the quick turnarounds, um, play a big part in, mm. in elevating you in that hierarchy of my preferred advisors or my trusted advisors. Mm. And um, is, is delivery the main thing that puts you at the forefront of clients' minds? Um, or are there other things that play a role there in terms of being the preferred guy? Yeah, I think, I think insights, right? I think it's experience. Um, I've had this debate with a number of, of colleagues around you know, the, 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 the generation Y, generation Z versus millennials, um, and the debate around how um, millennials want to come into organizations and from day one be seen to making an impact. Yeah. But sometimes it takes time, yeah. right? You're coming from a place of zero experience. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be difficult for you to make an impact. Granted, you've seen the world and the world is dynamic. So for me, you know, part of, part of what, moves you up um, is in, in the conversation with clients is experience, it's insights. So really being close to information, yes. really being close to what's happening in and around you. So, you know, I, I, I've, I've worked for an international organization where uh, with, within a short space of time, you kind of get a, a nice cross section on what's happening in the world. And that's really what you're trying to, to to outline to clients. We know what's happening. We've seen other situations, so we've got the experience. And on top of that, we can actually deliver this thing. Uh, we've demonstrated it. We've shown you in the quality of the work that we do. So there are a number of things that go into it, not just delivery, yeah. but I think the biggest one is probably, for me, is experience. Um, uh, it was, it's always been frustrating to me that uh, unfortunately, I, I'm only now starting to get gray hair, but the, the whole term gray hair, because I think sometimes um, people, and, and, and maybe it's a South African cultural thing, is that they always associate, um, you know, wisdom or experience with age. Whereas I think the world now is such that we're doing so much more now than what, you know, some of our older colleagues, our parents did. So the curve or the experience gets built up very quickly. Mm -hmm. But because people associate age with experience, people don't realize that actually, you know, you may have this young person stepping in, um, but they've actually been through a lot of the trenches in the world that we're living, in the current world. You know, um, I can't speak for the 80s because it was before my time. But but in, in, the, in the 2000s, there's very few things that... I'm not going to be at the pulse of, yeah. right? And, and unfortunately, that's also when the, the internet phase of our world started and the, the information superhighway. Yeah. And so I believe that the younger generation now absorbs so much more information that, you know, they, they bring that to the table. They bring a lot of the, the experience. But yes, sometimes, you know, age does play a part mm. because I think there, there are different skills that you learn with age that, um, that you certainly don't, get uh, when you're much younger. Mm. What do I mean by that? I mean, um, you know, there's the term, the exuberance of youth. Yeah. Us as younger people tend to be very impatient. Mm. What age does is teaches you to be patient. Mm. Um, teaches you, um, patience also teaches you like that, that, that gentle touch, right? Sometimes 
youth says, you know, if it's not happening for us and we grow impatient, yeah. we just try and brute force certain things. Yeah. Whereas sometimes age means patience and, um, you know, allow things to flow. Um, you know, don't force it. You know, that for me are some of the skills. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think long and the short, you know, experience, age, all of those things play a part. But the world we live in has just changed so much that, you know, everybody needs to take all of those factors in when, when engaging with people. Um, you know, it's great to have a gray hair uh, in, in any meeting. But at the same time, it's also about balancing out those dynamics um, in the sense that, you know, they have a role to play it and so do you. Um, and you've got to play to your strengths. Yeah. I can see when you speak about corporate finance, investment banking, there's a lot of passion, you know, uh, in you. Um, can you just help us understand what is investment banking? Uh, what is corporate finance? Mm. Investment banking is a little bit broader, so I'll start there. Um, investment banking is made up of a number of pieces. So you have balance sheet, which is the guys that lend large sums of money. So they rely on depositors' money and they use that to lend to corporates um, in different forms, whether it be leveraged finance, uh, property finance, uh, or real estate finance. Um, and then there's the advisory side of things. Mm -hmm. So corporate finance sits on the advisory side of the business. So yeah. uh, again, there's the term Chinese walls. The, the, the advisors typically don't share information with the, the guys that lend money and, and vice versa, unless obviously there's, a, there's, there's strict rules around how that happens. So corporate finance or advisory um, really is the part of the business where we advise corporates um, there are a number of things that we advise them on. I think yeah. you've, you've had a show where um, you've had an M&A lawyer on it. So, you know, that's part of the business. Mm -hmm. um, but we do the, the number crunching and, and sometimes the idea generation uh, when it comes to M&A yeah. uh, or mergers and acquisitions. Um, when companies are, one, looking to acquire other companies, um, two, um, looking to sell themselves, yeah. three, looking to sell parts of themselves when guys go and list on the JSE and say, well, we are going to raise money using the public markets, right? So then you go, you list on the JSE and you have a share that trades and people trade in and out of it. But when you list initially, you're selling a piece of the business, which you then list and it's equivalent to a certain number of shares. Um, then you have other pieces of the advisory business. There's debt capital markets. Again, Similar to the equity capital markets, there's another market where it's really centered around debt. Um, and we then advise clients when they're looking at various solutions yeah. linked to these primary products, whether it be M&A, equity capital markets, DCM, really those are the suite of products that we as corporate advisors look to sell in a way. Um, <laughs> Sell, and, 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 and it's not us going there, knocking on someone's door all the time. Mm. Selling means building relationships with corporates that mm. when they have a question around, should we be doing this? You've already, you, you can provide the solution. And if somebody says, well, we're looking to do this, can you help us do it? We say, well, we can help you do it. We've got processes and designs, and we can also help you find who are the right buyers. You know, this is me now double clicking into what, some of these things entail, yeah. right? Um, M&A, and, and that's what you're selling, right? You're selling yeah. your expertise in yeah. these different products and saying, well, if you want to do this, this is how we would advise you to do it. These are the people who you should approach. <laughs> these are the lawyers who you should bring in. These are the regulators that you need to speak to. You know, really the full spectrum of what are you going to have to overcome in order to deliver what you want, which is a subjective of either buying or selling a part of yourself. And then from a listing or equity capital markets perspective, you know, if you're looking to raise money, there are a number of ways. IPO is one, mm -hmm. uh, an accelerated book build um, process is another. And really, again, selling our expertise. One, how to execute that in the best possible way, because there are inherent dynamics that drive that. Um, also, how do you create or get the right type of investor looking at you as a company because that plays a huge part in 
in, in how the company grows because you don't list without the intention of having a strategy as to where you're going. So you want the sort of shareholders in there that would support that strategy, that would support management in delivering that strategy. So really those are the, the, the different pieces. And then obviously there's the balance sheet side, which is really um, you know, guys who work with companies, treasury teams, CFOs, um, to look at the capital structure within a company. Yeah. Where is money needed? Um, what kind of facilities? But also when, when you're looking to go and do an, an M&A process or buy another company, mm -hmm. you talk to the balance sheet guys because mm -hmm. they help you get all the money that you need yeah. in order to execute on what you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, so really there's always an interlinkage and that's, that for me in a nutshell kind of sums up investment bank, yeah. an investment bank. It really is guys who advise their clients on, on various solutions um, and those can be split into balance sheet solutions, you know, normal advisory solutions. Um, and, and I think that for me, I've always sat on the advisory side, but I think um, it's great that I've also sat with my uh, counterparts on the balance sheet side because sometimes some solutions actually um, come from collaboration between the two sides. When it's, yeah. you know, the Chinese wall is there when you're busy doing certain things, but when it's a, it's a, it's a fresh idea, the ability to collaborate across the wall is, is, is great because then it allows you to go to clients and really come with full-fledged solutions where you say, this is how we think you should do something. And oh, by the way, the bank is happy to fund uh, yes. and put money behind it. And I think clients um, love to hear things like that mm. where they, they, the, the bank can back up what it's saying, right? By supporting um, a proposition of sorts. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks for those insights. I think they're really, really powerful. You really broke it down nicely, you know, for us. And you mentioned a very important um, uh, issue around selling and how relationship building plays into that. What would you say are some of the most effective ways of relationship building? Do you just call, call people and say, let's go play golf? How do you build relationships? Sure. Um... Look, one, uh, relationships are built naturally. Um, I think don't force it, right? Um, don't force it. But one of the best ways is, is through networks. So network building is probably one of the key tools to building relationships. You know, sometimes to, to get to the CFO of a company, the best way isn't to cold call him or his secretary. The best way to get a hold of him is through somebody he knows well and trusts. And you start there. Um, one of my mentors said to me, you know, sometimes it takes 12, 18 months to build a corporate relationship from, from not knowing anybody in the company yeah. to being in a position where you can talk to guys on a regular basis. But what does that mean? That means that it's 18 months of coming up with different ideas, different solutions, continually engaging guys and, 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 and almost, you know, prodding different parts of their brain when it comes to thinking about their businesses uh, and about life in general. Because I think a lot of the C-suite, you know, the, 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 the businesses they're in are their lives. Yeah. Right? Some of them are founders of these companies. So they, 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 they birthed these companies. So anything that you you say to them is really, it re it's their baby. So for me, networks are key. Um, don't force it. And also just continuous engagement with, mm. with well thought out, smart, creative ideas. That for me, um, you know, stands atop at, at of, those three are, stand atop of any tools I, I believe are good for relationship building. Yeah. Um, and I think then obviously there's the time piece to say, when you don't force it and you allow it to, to evolve and you keep doing the right work, I believe that eventually, um, you know, the, the, the wall will come down and you'll then slowly move up the levels. You don't start off, again, uh, I, I mentioned it earlier, you don't start off being uh, in the upper tier. Your, your, your relationship building evolves, right? In the beginning, you're still on the outer rung you still get to have these conversations with clients or people. And, and over time you evolve, trust is built. And, and we know trust 
like in any relationship, takes time. And you then start moving up. And the type of solutions, the speed at which you turn things around, when, when somebody in real time is having a problem and you give them a, a really, really smart um, solution to what they're thinking, that plays a huge part in you evolving. Then there's obviously the, the softer side of things. Yes, a, a good round of golf is great. Um, you know, tennis, whatever it may be, um, you know, going to the cricket, that's part of the softer side. Because yeah. in that instance, you, you're also just removing the seriousness of all your conversations all the time. You, you're showing people that you're also human um, and that there is a side to you that is not just thinking mergers, acquisitions, <laughs> ECM, et cetera, but actually you enjoy the real world. Yeah. Um, so for me, you know, the, the first three are important. Um, the, 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 the social aspect of it is key over time, <laughs> but I think people lend themselves to be more social with you once you've evolved and, and are at a certain level of trust where they can come and they can spend, you know, a few hours with you at a sporting event, et cetera. Um, I find that, you know, if, if I'm not comfortable with somebody, you know, it'd be difficult for me to go and spend three hours with them playing a round of golf. Yeah. Um, but if there is a degree of trust, then I'm, I'm open to the possibility that let's go play a round of golf and let's see how this works out. And, and hopefully then that, that for me as the advisor guy, um, creates the opportunity. I've got to come in there and I've got to have the energy and, 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 and obviously um, the, the IQ to use that situation to elevate myself in, in, in the type of conversation I have with people. Fantastic. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that insight. Um, as far as your career is concerned, I think you've done incredibly well. I mean, starting... Uh, as a geologist and you moved into this completely different field and you've just continued to excel even right up to an international investment bank level. Um, I know while you were at that in international investment bank, you know, you did some incredible stuff there. Uh, can you just talk to us about that experience? What were some of the proudest uh, achievements that you were able to, um, to, to achieve uh, during that time? Sure. Um, sure. Uh, there, there are a few. Um, one, I think working for an investment bank was a, was a big achievement. I don't think uh, getting into an investment bank is by any means um, easy. Uh, I was fortunate enough to join probably one of you know, the top three global investment banks um, in the world. Uh, that was an absolutely phenomenal uh, achievement. Um, and then along the way, we did a number of deals. Um, I think probably I can highlight two, right, uh, that, that for me stand out. Um, we worked on what was the NASPAS process listing. Um, and really that was, you know, something completely new in the sense that dealing with a very live problem. NASPAS is the biggest company on the JSE, um, you know, guys have issues when the share price starts to perform and all sorts of various dynamics that drive that company. Mm -hmm. And to be able to work on something of that scale um, with you know, very senior people within NASPERS uh, to find a potential solution alongside a number of things that they were doing at the time, mm -hmm. that for me was a, was a big highlight because you know, it was an opportunity to work with different parts of the bank that I had never worked with in the sense that you know, you were talking to guys in New York, you were talking to guys in London, you were talking to guys um, in Asia, and really trying to find different ways mm. um, to try and find a solution for this client. Um, so that was one. And also, I think the one piece around that deal was, was the stakeholder piece and a lot of the work that went into speaking to local stakeholders. I think there's always the view that um, the regulatory environment in South Africa is very tough and therefore it impacts uh, our ability to attract foreign direct investment. So it, it, it then showed that actually, you know, if you have a plan and a structure, you can overcome some of those challenges that uh, are quickly highlighted by people, by naysayers and, and people that really have, uh, you know, not so great things to say about the country. 
Then I think it was um, working uh, on a deal in the financial services space um, where we, we did a sell down for of one of um, the shareholders of, of First Rand Group. Mm -hmm. um, really, it was working on that because that was something that I had worked on, I had originated. And so it, it really came in. It, it, it was something I had a lot of pride in, in the sense that, you know, I had almost birthed this thing and kind of taken it all the way up to, to execution. So for me, that was a great, and, and the outcome that was achieved, because I think at the time, lots of questions about um, the ability to, to deliver what we were saying. Um, you know, it's one thing to have the credentials, but it's also another thing to try and um, throw the bones and, 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 and understand how the market is gonna react to something. Mm, mm. Um, so delivering that solution um, better than what the client had anticipated. Yeah. Um, and having, having, uh, having pitched this work so many times um, and to really kind of see it then come to fruition, that really for me was a, was a, was a great outcome. And I think then um, I was a resource manager for, uh, for the investment bank in terms of my investment banking team. What that means is looking after a lot of the, the juniors in the team. And, and for me, the COVID year was, uh, was a watershed year. It was, everything was different, right? Um, everybody's working from home. And to have, to have seen the bank achieve um, number one in market share in that year, to not have had people leave the team during that year or during my tenure as the resource manager, I think I touched on it in the beginning, um, for an investment bank to really do well, stability is probably um, one of the foundations of the performance. So to have kept the team together um, during what was probably the craziest time for me um, in terms of COVID, that was a great outcome as well. So yeah. we achieved a number one uh, ranking, but at the same time, the team remains stable. Yeah. Um, I think people are important. Um, and during that time, you have people staying alone. So my job also had to shift. So that's why I see it as a, a big achievement. It wasn't just about focusing on deals. It was about focusing on people, focusing on people's, well, people's well-being to ensure that they can also navigate this, this, this period. I was fortunate. I was home with somebody, but not everybody had, had that, that good fortune. Some people were alone, um, you know, and, and so people's mental health was really affected. And mm. so you need to monitor those things and the ability to make sure that the team is in a healthy mental state was probably one of the, the underlying successes um, for, for, for what we achieved. Yeah. So that for me was a, was a big outcome. Deal making on the one side, but, but also the people um, achievement on the other side. And that for me in the last few years has probably been um, one of the biggest when it came to mm. uh, being in an investment bank and, uh, and an international one um, and, and, and what we've managed to achieve. That's fantastic. I think a number of the um, issues you touched on in the end there speak to leadership. You know, uh, can you just give us your perspectives around leadership? How do you define leadership? And what do you think makes an excellent leader? Um, maybe I'll use the analogy of, uh, of, a, of a, the captain of a ship, right? I think leadership is the captain knows that this is where the ship needs to get to. Um, and in order for the ship to get to that destination, there are a number of things that need to happen. You need to have, you have navigators, you have engineers and mechanics, you have clients or customers on the boat. So I think for me, it's, it's somebody who has a clear strategy yeah. uh, on, on where they're going and how they're going to get there. But also somebody who, before the ship even departs, has... has has also put the necessary building blocks in place to ensure that that strategy can be delivered, mm. right? I think one of the biggest challenges when, when, when as a South African, I, I look at what's happening around us, we have, we have good leaders, we have bad leaders, but sometimes the, the, the challenge that we're facing is that our leaders maybe lack the planning or putting the tools in place because 
we're all great at conceptualizing ideas in this country, but execution tends to be where we are probably not too great at. Um, you know, South Africans by, by their nature are very intelligent people. Mm. But, you know, where we let ourselves down is, you know, we love networks, caucuses, whatever you want to call it. But it's let's move everything from the whiteboard onto let's make it tangible. So for me, leaders are guys that, that can drive a strategy and push the execution all the way to the end. Um, I think that they're, they're, they're people that also understand their people. So good leaders have a high EQ, mm. you know, but at the same time, as much as they're intelligent, but they also know how to understand their people, some of the pressure points and how, how to navigate some of them. So I think for me, leaders are captains, right? The captain doesn't need to know everything about his ship, but he has a group of people around him that he trusts who can help him run the ship smoothly. But he knows one thing. I control the direction of the ship, but I have people around me who ensure that I can maintain that direction. I can maintain that speed um, that I want to achieve. I can, I can not have people falling overboard, um, but also at the same time, I can deliver a journey that people come back and they say, you know, what a journey. We had so much fun. You know, we, we, went, we sailed through storms. Mm -hmm. We had calm seas, but it never felt like things weren't in control. So it's somebody that also overall shows that they're in control yeah. and that they know where we're going to. No matter what, no matter which direction the winds may be blowing, you know, he still understands or she understands the, the direction of travel. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant analogy. As we draw to a close, um, obviously, you know, you are someone who's achieved very much in your career. And that's not only known by you and friends and family. Uh, you were part of the 2019 Mail and Guardian uh, 200. Um, can you tell us what was that about? What did it mean for you to be part of that, uh, you know, select list of young South Africans? Um, sure. Uh, I guess it, it maybe highlighted just some of the things that I'd been doing. Um, but it also just put you into a group of people where you understand that, you know, we're part of the solution for this country. Mm. You know, what I liked about, about that was it's different people from different sectors or, or spheres of, of industry. Um, and it just was a reminder or, or maybe a call to, to arms to say, guys, you are the people that should really be pushing this country forward. Yeah. Um, that for me is what it, what it really meant. It said, you know, but drive it from not just your areas of expertise. Uh -huh. we're, we're laying out the Rolodex of people who are doing it and, you know, they're there, right? So many hands make light work. Mm. And if we all work together in all of our different spheres, we can drive this economy forward. So for me, it was a great achievement, one, but it was also just a reminder to say, you know, there are people, there, there are really good people out there that can actually um, help move this country uh, that we love, all love so much um, in the right direction. I, I, I think that for me, there is so much intelligence, so much hard work in this country that I always see those things as, as ways to say, well, who are the people who are doing things? Because sometimes, you know, we're so caught up in our own lives, careers, etc., we don't realize there are other people who are doing similar phenomenal things in their fields. And if we all got to know each other, work together, um, that's what would help us drive our economy forward, more people get employed, really getting this place that we live in, um, you know, working like the best possible machine it can be. Yeah, powerful. Um, any parting words of wisdom that you may want to share? Sure. Um, I think uh, for anybody that wants to get into, into banking or financial services, I think grit is important. Um, it's not an easy job. Um, it's, it's a, it sometimes can be a thankless job, but the, the learning curve is steep. And if you want to learn, 
different skills, dealing with people, um, you know, being an expert in, in financial modeling, in, um, in, in advisory, in, in, in lending money. There's so, many, there's so many different things. So I encourage people to continue to do that. I think there's always a stigma around maths and science, um, but it's important to do things like that because they allow you to get into these sort of fields. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's for people to continue to strive, um, to really have the grit and the courage to want to break into this environment. I'm, I'm encouraged by seeing uh, more of my brothers, sisters, people who look like me uh, in this industry because then it, it helps deepen the networks and allows us to access the relationships that we typically would not have been able to access 15, 20 years ago because of the nature of how our economy is structured. But I'm encouraged by what I see and so I'm, 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 I'm also saying to people, you know, let's keep, let's keep it going. Let's have the grit to, to stay on. Let's have the grit to make friends. We're, we're, not, we're not enemies and no man is an island yet. Mm -hmm. But if we work together, certainly we can change the look and feel of, of, of the economy. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Last question for me. What is your next big chapter? Sure. Um, I'm still figuring it out. Um, a number of things are, are, are on the table for me. Um, but I think I'll always say to people, just watch the space. Um, I think I'm still very hungry to, to, to be a deal maker. Um, and so that's probably the direction, the course of travel I will continue on. Um, whether it be within a bank, in a corporate, on my own, I think that's what I'm, what I'm currently just trying to figure out. But it's watch the space. I, I, I've always thought, uh, I've always backed myself in life. I wouldn't be where I am if I didn't. And it's not an ego, but it's really um, having a little bit of confidence in myself and, uh, and what I want to achieve. So yeah. really I say to people, watch the space. It's, it's not determined now, but, uh, but definitely it will be and, and it will start showing itself in, in the not too distant future. Yeah. Brilliant. Indeed, we will be watching this space and we really can't wait to see what's coming up. Kanyasani, thank you so much. Really appreciate you, you know, taking the time to chat to me. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers.